Thank you, Vice President. Um, I think we can promise to, that we will back you up in, in any of your fights if you promise to come back and speak to us. So, so that's a deal. Um, very pleased to welcome our next uh, keynote speaker, one of the world's leading uh, economists, Dr. Hal Varian. <laughs> I saw that. Um, Hal Varian is uh, Google's chief economist. Uh, and also a professor emeritus at UC Berkeley. Um, in addition to authoring two major microeconomics textbooks that have been translated into 22 languages, um, he's also done groundbreaking research in the area of information economics. Uh, he's the co-author of the bestseller um, Information Rules, A Strategic Guide, to the network economy, um, which, and I haven't uh, verified this, has been translated into every known human language uh, in addition to Klingon. So that's something I, f I found out late last night. Um, something I also found out was that um, Hal Varian has been quoted as saying that the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statistician. And, um, this gives us some hope in, uh, in OFE, as one of our long-standing goals has been to make um, standards sexy. So um, there's some hope in there. Um, please help me welcome Dr. Hal Varian. I thought uh, standards were already sexy, I guess. OK, this year. OK. so. Uh, of course, there's no need to tell this audience uh, we think open systems are great. I hardly need to say that. But they don't just happen. In order for open systems to be successful, there has to be a lot of work behind the scenes by organizations like this, by standard-setting bodies in industry and government, and many other groups. And what I want to talk about today a bit are some of these challenges to openness, some of the problems that arise and and what we can uh, try to do to overcome them. Now, before I get to that topic, I'll, I need to balance things by saying just a few words about the benefits of openness from an economic perspective. Uh, we're all familiar here with network effects. When you have a network good, the value of the network depends on the number of users, so that larger networks or platforms tend to create more value for the participants. Uh, there's reduced switching costs and lock-in that we heard uh, about a few minutes ago. When you have many alternative providers of a technology, then you have a credible threat to switch, and that enhances competition in an industry, and of course has consequent benefits for consumers. Uh, there's an issue of interoperability. If you have a common standard, you can have interconnection. Uh, for example, the internet, as we heard, uh, started out just as a technology for transferring files but then uh, it evolved into a technology for email, for voice over IP, for streaming video, and lots of other ways of, of uh, communicating information. Uh, when you have standards that facilitates modularization, so you have a standardized interface that allow for modular design, which tends to be simpler and more robust. So for example, a standardized document format then allows you to easily incorporate one document into another, or to create multi-authored documents, or do all sorts of uh, subsequent transformations. And finally, these off-the-shelf modules, when you have a standard modular format, then you have building blocks for future innovation. I think this is a very, very critical idea. I've referred to it as, uh, as uh, combinatorial innovation. Having lots of component parts allows you to uh, assemble those component parts into different uh, innovations and generally facilitates the process of, uh, of innovation. Now, there's a fundamental equation that I think we all have to understand when we're contemplating the role of uh, open systems in the economy, and that is when you look at your value as an industry participant, uh, you can write that as your share times total industry value. So there's kind of the public piece, the total industry value, and there's the private piece, your share of that value. And when you have uh, these issues surrounding network effects and avoidance of lock-in and interoperability, 
the industry value can be a very, very important part of that uh, equation. So each company has a common interest in increasing the industry value, and then they have a private interest in increasing their own share of that value. So conflict isn't inevitable. There's obviously a conflict on your share. They have to sum up to 100%, but there isn't necessarily a conflict on the uh, increasing the total value of the industry. And that's why coopetition is really the norm in technology industries. Now I have to warn you, coopetition is not an English word. You can't look it up in the dictionary. It was a term made up by Ray uh, Norda of Novell. But I think it's a very important concept. It's a combination of cooperation on the one hand and competition on the other hand. And the fundamental equation I mentioned earlier, your share times total industry value, well, you exploit or increase the total industry value by cooperation, and you uh, try to get your share of that value via uh, competition. So the, uh, co co the cooperation uh, can be in uh, things such as standard setting, the topic uh, we're talking about today, and then the competition can be in things like product innovation or pricing decisions or cost reduction that accrue to the individual players. And I, I think both pieces are quite uh, critical. Now, the, the problem is when, uh, e even though I think overall there is this force to try to increase the industry value, there are cases where uh, this can break down and that leads to the challenges uh, of openness that I alluded to a few minutes ago. So one example of this is uh, strategic manipulation. So because the networks and common platforms can produce so much value, then companies will invest heavily in them in order to extract that value, and that opens up some possibilities for strategic manipulation. So one concept that we've heard to a lot in economics is uh, time consistency. Uh, it's quite easy to promise openness, but then not actually deliver, because you may want to promise openness and to make into making your products uh, widely adopted, but then the issue is, well, how do we ensure that PP people actually deliver uh, on that promise of openness? For example, it's easy to make openness in one direction. Uh, you can import a competitor's documents, but then uh, not uh, export them, for example. Uh, you can have a, pro a powerful proprietary format and then a weak uh, open format. And these things can happen either, even when the individual players uh, deal in good faith. For example, there's often changes in ownership in private businesses. For example, if you look at Sun, which was recently acquired by Oracle, which Sun was a great champion of uh, Java, and Open Office, and other open source initiatives, and Oracle has a somewhat different perspective on some of those uh, some of those choices. Uh, you look at bankruptcy, like the Nortel bankruptcy, where there was a huge number of patents, some of which were part of industry standard uh, agreements, and then those patents were uh, sold once the company went bankrupt. So there can often be initial commitment to openness, and then there might be a change of ownership or some other structure that uh, casts some of those openness issues into doubt. Now, how do you solve that problem? Well, there can be binding industry standards that constrain behavior, multilateral legal contracts, such as, uh, contracts such as uh, RAND licensing. And I think these days, one of the very, very powerful tools uh, for openness is, in fact, open source. Because if you think about what open source does, it provides a commitment to openness by releasing the uh, code or the document formats or whatever in a uh, usable uh, format and provides an actual commitment to, uh, to, this time cons to solve this time consistency problem that I alluded to a minute ago. So examples would be OpenOffice, Android, Firefox, uh, Chrome, and so on, where it's not just a claim of openness, but in fact actually providing the open source that allows for that uh, time consistency. Now note that it's usually the competitors and the complementers, that is the firms that provide complementary products of a dominant firm that pushes for the standards or open source in the first place. So there's a nice history of standards development in the automotive industry back in 1915, where it was not the dominant firms at the time, which then was Ford and GM, but it was all the individual suppliers 
that banded together to try to, try to create industry standards to make them more competitive with the uh, leading firms. And that's been a story that's been replayed over and over again when you look at the history of standards. So for example, uh, at one point IBM had a standard for local area networks called Token Ring, which is a very uh, widely used standard. And you saw three companies, Digital, Intel, and Xerox, uh, band together to create an alternative open standard called Ethernet. And as we know, Ethernet has ended up being uh, pretty much the open industry standard for local area networking. A uh, similar example was Sun with Open Office, where, of course, they weren't the dominant firm in providing office software, but they were uh, leaders in trying to create a uh, open document format. And if you look at Android and Chrome, Google's own open source initiatives, Google was by no means a leader in the uh, mobile world when they started, but they were a provider of a complementary product, namely search and advertising services. And so it was quite important to Google to have a uh, competitive and open environment for uh, both uh, telephone mobile operating systems and um, web browsers. Okay, another issue that's important when you look at uh, challenges to openness is a rush for standardization because sometimes you can have premature standardization. Because networks are valuable, uh, it's often the case that you might try to standardize on something before the standard is really uh, mature. So for example, that would be uh, in the US, we standardized on a number of scan lines and analog TV. Uh, Europe came on a couple years later and standardized on uh, a better system. So uh, it's common for people uh, back when analog TV was widely used, it was common for people to look at that fuzzy picture in the US and say, why is it so bad? And the answer was really the US standardized, uh, I would say somewhat prematurely in that particular case. When there was a race to develop high definition TV between uh, US and Japan, uh, Japan went the analog route and, and the US went for the digital route. Japan standardized prematurely on a analog version of HDTV. If you look at wide area networking, there was a standards battle that went on, or maybe not a battle, but a standards uh, debate that went on between uh, OSI uh, and uh, TCP IP where I think there was a move to standardize on OSI really before the technology was there to, uh, to support it. So you might ask, when is a technology uh, ready or ripe for standardization? And I think there's not a uniform answer. It depends on the nature of the technology. Because sometimes you have industries that are inherently network industries, and you can't really get going until you have a standard. So examples would be things like local area networks or mobile phones, CDs, DVDs, HDTVs. There's got to be a standard in place to even uh, start the industry. But sometimes there's a choice about when to standardize. And the temptation to standardize prematurely is there because having standards that fragment and having standard wars can be very, very costly. At one time, with writable DVDs, there were six different standards. We all lived through the Blu-ray and HD DVD standard. And of course, there's the classic of uh, VHS versus beta and video recorders. And the general rule is, unless you have this kind of network industry that I alluded to earlier, you want to try to look for a point where the, where the uh, technology plateaus and then in that case, uh, it's quite attractive to standardize the interface and essentially turn the product or the service into a commodity. So in Silicon Valley, we talk sometimes about the race to the motherboard. You might have alternative standards for, let's say, local area networks, and uh, you're trying to get your standard or a standard, whether you're operating in private interest or whether it's uh, industry interest, you're trying to get a particular standard uh, commoditized, put on the motherboard, turned into something that's so cheap and ubiquitous and functions well that really uh, that's the natural choice for anybody who wants to <coughs> innovate further. And I think this further innovation is really the critical part because once you have a technology that has become standardized and to some degree commoditized, uh, 
then it becomes a component for future innovation and uh, allows further development on top of that uh, particular standard. Um, the danger, of course, is if you have a very rapidly evolving technology uh, and you standardized at one particular point, uh, it may be that that standard won't fit the needs or won't realize the possibilities of, that, uh, uh, of the technology in the future. The standard can fork. You can have different uh, standards becoming available if you uh, standardize uh, prematurely. You have to have someone that can manage the standard innovation and coordinate both the evolutionary steps and the revolutionary steps when you have new technological possibilities that weren't available when the standard was originally conceived. So there's always going to be something of a trade-off between backwards compatibility and making the standard uh, move forward and then having superior performance. Uh, you know, there's this old line about how, how did God create the universe in only six days? And the answer is he didn't have an installed base to worry about. Now, because companies want to compete via differentiation, I always want to say my product is better or cheaper than uh, my competitors, uh, it's possible to lose interoperability because of those competitive forces. So the classic example is Unix. At one time, there was just one Unix from AT&T. And then uh, when workstations became popular, it morphed into versions of Unix that ran only on IBM hardware, only on HP hardware, only on Sun hardware, Apollo hardware, and so on. And there was no champion that could really push the technology forward in a unified way. Now that ended up being solved by open source. It was Linux and BSD that contributed to a kind of a standardization, or I would say a mostly standardized uh, Unix. And if you go back and look at the development of the web, these forces came together uh, just at the right time because we had this wonderful suite of applications, the LAMP applications, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Python, all open source that allowed pretty much anybody to develop a web application at a very, very low uh, cost. Now, the challenge of fragmentation in a competitive environment is always uh, going to be with us. Here, in the case of the web, in the case of uh, Unix, it was solved by open source. There's a very interesting story last month in Business Week, a cover story about Nokia's decision to adopt the Windows mobile OS, and the claim in the article was that uh, Microsoft was willing to grant uh, flexibility to Nokia with respect to interoperability requirements so that Nokia was able to, uh, according to the story, was able to innovate unilaterally uh, and not necessarily uh, required to adhere to the interoperability requirements that one normally has when you're trying to build a network uh, systems. I, uh, don't have any first-hand information about this. I'm only going by what was available in the story. But it's a nice example because anytime you do develop a standard for interoperability, firms would like to innovate on top of this, potentially in ways that uh, destroy or at least make the interoperability uh, much more difficult. Now, it's absolutely critical to have an interoperability standard if you're trying to build a network. Otherwise, there's no network. Uh, and the challenge is how do you uh, make sure that people can A, adhere to the interoperability standard, and B, still innovate uh, on top of that standard without destroying that interoperability. Now, avoiding Fragmentation of a standard is actually quite difficult when you have open source because, by definition, anybody can take that open source and modify it in any uh, way they want. And even, for example, uh, with the Android operating system from Google that I mentioned earlier, the code is fragmented to some degree uh, because if you look at the Nook, the uh, ebook reader from Barnes & Noble that's built on top of Android, you look at the uh, forthcoming uh, Amazon Kindle, which is said to be built on top of, Am of uh, Android. 
these do not necessarily interoperate with the other uh, components of the system. However, they are uh, targeted towards very particular uses, namely ebook uh, reading on, uh, on tablet uh, devices, so that particular fragmentation may not be too bad from the viewpoint of the uh, common use of, uh, on mobile phones. Um, the next challenge to openness that I want to mention is the problem of excessive power. In some sense, fragmentation comes from having too little power. If you make the system completely open so anybody can modify it, you have this difficulty of managing the fragmentation. But then if you have companies that have potentially excessive power from controlling a proprietary standard, you also create uh, difficulties. Uh, it's hard, for example, to engender uh, trust. So the prime example of this, I think, is why don't we have a single transparent electronic payment system at the consumer level? Well, I think the answer is that if a single party controlled electronic payments, it would be extraordinarily powerful, and every player in the industry is worried about one of their competitors uh, grasping this power, and so we end up with a sort of put together payment system that's not really very transparent and not really very efficient because no one wants to cede power to another party. You know, Andy Grove famously said that uh, only the paranoid survive. So of course, everybody is uh, somewhat paranoid in this respect and that means it may be hard to push forward with a common standard. And of course, this would be a very natural place for governments to step in, and I think they've attentively dipped their toe in this, uh, in this uh, issue, but it hasn't really moved forward uh, very rapidly. And there's a similar, but I think much simpler issue with electronic books, where there's a proliferation of standards, some proprietary and some open, and no party wants to cede control to their competitors, uh, at least at this stage. I think that eventually there will have to be an uh, interoperable standard for electronic books in order for the industry to thrive, but uh, it's going to take a while for that to work itself out. And unlike the payment system example, I think this is probably something that's uh, better left to the, to the private sector, even though it may be frustrating to uh, many of us, uh, I, I think that's the natural place to fight out that particular uh, battle. Now, with respect to that issue, I think it's important to recognize the absolutely critical role of adapters and uh, connectors, because you can have disparate networks that have a common uh, converter or adapter so that from the viewpoint of the individual participants of that industry, the uh, disparate networks are essentially transparent. So think about uh, document formats. We have lots and lots of doc different document formats out there. But if we had perfect adapters or perfect converters, then who cares if there are disparate uh, document formats because that becomes transparent from the viewpoint of the users. And I alluded a few minutes ago to the problem of six different formats for writable DVDs. Well, the industry worked well enough that uh, these were reasonably transparent with respect to the user. That is, your piece of hardware would look at the disk and say, oh, this is DVD minus, or this is DVD RW, or this is DVD whatever, and then uh, do the right uh, thing. So even though there were different standards, having good adapters and connectors uh, allowed for those to not be too much of an impediment to the development of the industry. And I think we will see ebooks evolving in this, uh, in this particular direction. In fact, if you think about the internet, which, which we uh, just heard discussed, it really is just a, uh, a standard because it's kind of an adapter between uh, devices and, and uh, local area networks. Doesn't really matter how you connect to the internet. You can use Wi-Fi. Ethernet, DSL, cable, satellite, all of these different technologies which have their own standard, but once you've got two separate devices connecting to the internet, the internet provides this uh, common standard that allows for the uh, 
uh, interoperability. And this is also true of the web, which has become a kind of connector for many different document formats and many different uh, modes of, uh, of communication. So finally, let me just say a couple words about the government versus the private sector. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say versus, I should say the government and the private sector, uh, their uh, roles in standard setting. I think uh, the government has this advantage that they can be uh, very, very thorough, but sometimes rather slow, whereas in industry it has a very strong private incentives for rapid uh, standardized setting, uh, more urgency, but not necessarily uh, quite so uh, thorough. So both systems have uh, an advantage. When we're talking about government documents, I've done some work on classification systems. We look at industry classification or job classification, product classification, and so on. And generally, you'll find that the private sector, in order to get a product out the door, you'll develop a standard or a, uh, let's say, a, a, a a system for, um, for uh, taxonomy or classification very, very rapidly, and the system will evolve to keep pace with the uh, developments in uh, industries, but they don't have the historical integrity that uh, government taxonomies and classification systems normally have. If you look at the Bureau of the Census in the US, it's very, very important to them that you keep a standard that persists across time. So when you're talking about uh, product definitions, they mean the same thing now that they meant uh, a few years ago. Well, obviously, if technology advances, that's not necessarily going to be possible. But uh, they attempt to do it uh, in as much as they can, whereas the private sector generally tends to be much more forward looking and does not necessarily uh, recognize this uh, issue of trying to, main uh, ma trying to maintain the uh, historical uh, integrity for the uh, taxonomies. So there's not a single answer about which uh, system is best for that uh, example either. Uh, you've got to show some flexibility and also try to maintain uh, consistency. I think my own opinion would be that, uh, that the uh, driver of a lot of these standards should be come from the private sector because mm -hmm. uh, they, are, they tend to be responsive to uh, commercial needs very quickly, but um, the government then uh, can find a role, a definite role to intervene uh, when there are compelling reasons to do so, such as some of the uh, points I mentioned earlier. So what can the government do? Well, they can encourage industry standard setting, obviously, uh, provide enlightened intellectual property laws and antitrust laws about uh, talking with competition in order to create these uh, industry standards that confer so much value. Uh, they can obviously enforce private contracts such as the RAND licensing and step in when necessary to uh, make these uh, systems work. Recognize their power of being large purchasers. This is certainly the case, for example, in the security industry, the government trying to set standards for uh, secure communications. Patent reform, uh, the kinds of movements that we've seen uh, happening in the US and in Europe on rights for prior use and trying to clarify this standard of novelty that should be necessary to uh, acquire patents in the first place and try to avoid uh, the use of uh, patents as, uh, as kind of uh, patent thicket issues where there are battles which are not, uh, which are purely rent seeking, transferring rents back and forth rather than pushing uh, the industry forward. And then finally the copyright reform where I think there's a pretty clear understanding now that we should be moving towards uh, a registry system. We need to find ways to deal with orphan works. We need to find ways to try to uh, respect the rights of intellectual property right holders but also don't let, allow the industry to advance in terms of uh, being able to provide flexible markets in those uh, rights. So there's lots of things to be done. I think there are lots of interesting economic issues, and we're going to watch with great interest to see how these play out in the next uh, decade. Thank you.
uh, many interesting uh, examples in there. I took a lot of notes. Um, I think we'll be uh, seeing a film. Is that, uh, is that going to happen now? If everybody's ready? The message from France. Et au-delà du développement de services publics en ligne, Internet a renforcé l'exigence de transparence que le citoyen est en droit d'attendre de la part de ses gouvernements. C'est un mot important. La transparence n'est pas sans poser des problèmes. Mais c'est une exigence, la transparence. Et, et, et elle est amenée 